Good evening. Th thank you for joining us. My name is Dr. George Girardi. Um, I'm an interventional pain physician in Fort Collins, Colorado. I've been in practice for approximately 25 years now. I'm here with Jessica Jameson. I'll go ahead and let Jessica introduce herself at this point. Thank you. My name is Jessica Jamison. I'm also an interventional pain physician. Uh, I practice in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and I've been in practice for about eight years at this point. Okay, thanks, Jessica. And again, thank you for joining us. We're here to discuss chronic pain and its management and some of the different um, therapies that, that are out there. Um, and hopefully the audience can obtain a lot of knowledge um, after this webinar about all the different options they that are out there. Um, we're going to discuss chronic pain and its management. Um, one of the therapies that we're going to uh, talk about tonight is neural stimulation therapy. I'm sure everybody in the audience is familiar with the opioid epidemic. So consequently, as physicians, we've really tried to find other ways to manage pain. Um, and so consequently, neural stimulation has become much more prevalent in our practices. We're going to discuss a therapy that is an Abbott therapy. Um, it's a Proclaim XR spinal cord stimulator system with something called Burst technology. And again, we will go into what exactly that is. Um, hopefully, the audience will, will get a sense of if they're a potential candidate for these type of therapies. And then we'll show you steps on how to you, you can pursue these therapy. And then you'll have chances to, to ask anything from you like from Jessica and myself, um, who, who both have we have a lot of experience with these therapies. So living with chronic pain, um, you know, you're not alone. There's, there's so many people out there that, that have these problems. Anywhere from, depend on what studies you look at, anywhere from one in 10 adults suffer from chronic pain. Some studies show up to 50 million people in the United States suffer from chronic pain. But chronic pain is very burdensome. It, it interferes with your quality of life. It interferes with, with your psychological aspects in your life, creates anxiety, creates depression. Again, does not allow people to live the way they want to live. Because um, again, there's just this always heavy burden. There's always something gnawing on you when you do, do live in chronic pain. Um, again, when you look around your neighborhood, one in 10 of your neighbors are probably suffering from something, and it's not age-specific. Different age groups suffer from different pain statistically, but, again, um, it, it affects all age groups. And the economic aspect of chronic pain is immense. To put it in perspective, um, you, you know, you can look at statistics and you can see that we spend between – somewhere between five and $600 billion a year taking care of patients with chronic pain. Now that includes the medical care they get, that includes lost income or lost wages and lost productivity. So it costs society a huge amount of money um, in addition to obviously patient suffering. To put that in perspective, um, that's about between two and 3% of our gross national product is $560 billion. So that's a large amount. And again, to really, so, so people really understand how much money we spend taking care of chronic pain, the, our national defense costs us about $600 billion a year. So we're, pain costs our country at almost as much as our national defense costs our country. So it is, it is a lot of money. And this is not just a problem in the United States. The World Health Organization states that globally, you know, up to one in 10 patients have a chronic pain syndrome. Again, similar to the statistics we said for the United States before. Um, chronic pain is more prevalent. It, 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 it encompasses so many, so many people. It's more than heart disease, diabetes, and cancer all combined. And again, it affects all age groups. Now, different age groups tend to have different uh, pain syndromes, like, you know, people in their 60s and 70s may have arthritic joints, like an arthritic hip or an arthritic knee and spinal stenosis, where younger people may have chronic pain syndrome as a consequence of trauma, or they could have some hereditary disease like rheumatoid arthritis. But nevertheless, that's the role of, of the interventional pain physician is we have to understand what 
creates these chronic pain syndromes for us to adequately treat these. And the therapies have changed immensely. Years ago, you know, it was just giving people some medications, but we have came up with multiple interventional procedures that significantly help people. Um, but again, it's something you need to be evaluated for and discuss with, you, with your physician. So what is pain? People think of pain as just as, as one thing, but it's really not. There's different kinds of pain. There's the mechanical pain that something like an arthritic knee will cause. We, we have some big fancy terms for pain. So what we really do is we separate pain into something called nociceptic and neuropathic pain. So you'll hear those terms when you um, talk to physicians or other people who, who practice this type of medicine. But what nociceptive pain or mechanical pain refers to, just to give you some examples, is somebody, you know, if you slam your, your, your hand in your car door, you're going to have a mechanical pain right away because of the injury to that hand. Or if you have an arthritic knee, that's a mechanical pain. There's something structurally wrong, and your body is telling you that, that there's something wrong. For example, you slam your hand in the car door, you withdraw your hand, and that's an acute pain syndrome. Um, that's very different than something called the chronic pain syndromes or the neuropathic pain syndromes that we're going to discuss. And neuropathic pain, for example, is that person who slams their hand in that car door. You know, they cut it up, they bruise it up, they may break a bone. Um, all that eventually heals. And over, you know, six to eight weeks, that pain should eventually go away. But sometimes, you know, somebody will have a cast on and that cast will come off and, you know, the orthopedist will look and say, well, your bones healed quite well, but the patient's going to say, well, I still have this chronic burning type of sensation um, that doesn't go away. It's, it's always there, and just touching my hand hurts. That's something called neuropathic pain, and that can go on and on and on. Um, and this is caused by the way pain is transmitted to the brain is there's pain receptors, for example, in that hand that travel up the nerves into the spinal cord and then from the spinal cord go to your brain, and your brain then processes that and tells your body that that hurts. Um, so that's the way pain is transmitted. But again, patients need to be evaluated, if, especially in the chronic state, for a physician to determine what type of pain it is to know how to adequately treat it. Treat it. All pain is not the same, and all pain should not be treated the same. So how's pain, chronic pain different? So one of the big differentiations we, we use as we classify pain is acute or chronic. Acute pain, again, is you break your hand, you break your arm, you have acute pain for a short period of time. For I shouldn't say short if you're that patient, um, six to eight weeks or so. So that pain should then heal. But if that pain persists and changes in character from that acute pain to more this burning feeling or tingling feeling, or sometimes people will complain of a light, like a lightning type of sensation or electrical sensation. That's when you've transitioned from having an acute pain syndrome to a chronic pain syndrome. And again, these, both of these, syndrome, these pain syndromes are treated differently. The, the acute pain is treated, and, and that's where, you know, pain medicine has a role in that very acute episode where you've had that injury. But then as you transition to the chronic pain, which hopefully patients don't, but if they do, pain medicines aren't near as effective, but our interventional procedures are much more effective. So what's the treatment? So first we start, we, you know, we have a tier of treatments. And so typically we're going to start with very conservative things. And we're going to do, um, you know, you injure your hands, you're going to ice it. You're going to take some anti-inflammatory agents. Um, you know, if, if it's a, a long-term injury, you're probably going to have some physical therapy. Um, some patients will end up having some biofeedback and things like that or behavioral therapy. But those, there's that first conservative set of treatment that, you know, in a perfect world, we can get everybody better with those conservative treatments. Um, it, when those conservative treatments fail, and then, then we will um, – go on to the, the, the second tier. And the second tier, and there's debate on this, but 
you know, as that slide's going to present to you is when we use opiates and nerve blocks. Now, sometimes, depending on the what the injury is or, or um, what the pain pattern is, sometimes we're not going to go to opiates. Um, but if a nerve block's appropriate, we're probably going to try that, again, because the risk of a nerve block is, is pretty minimal. You don't have addiction problems. Um, you don't have overdose problems with things like that. Um, and then the third tier is what we're going to discuss tonight is, is Sometimes people are amenable to some radial frequency therapies, which radial frequency is where we lesion nerves. But a lot of times we're going to, at this point, end up with neurostimulation, which is the spinal cord stimulators that we're going to go into um, throughout the course of tonight. So what is spinal cord stimulation? So spinal cord stimulation has been around for approximately 50 years. It kind of hit the medical scene in 1967 where there was a well-known publication um, and some doctors were using it. So, and it's continued to grow. But what it is, is we place a little catheter in, in what we call the epidural space. And the epidural space, most people are familiar with the epidural space because they'll hear the term epidural or what we use in women in labor. And when a woman's in labor, um, as anesthesiologists, we put a little catheter into the epidural space and infuse medicine and numb up those nerves so they don't feel those painful impulses. This catheter is placed in the same place. It's placed into the epidural space where those nerves come out. But instead of giving medications, we create a small electrical field. And what that electrical field does is it blocks those painful impulses, for example, if the pain's in your leg, we place it in your mid-back. If the pain's in your arm, we place it in your neck. Um, but you block those painful impulses where they ent enter the spinal cord so your, your brain does not detect those pa painful impulses. Um, and, and again, this, this, just makes, this does not change the natural history of the pain, but it makes patients um, able to tolerate the pain and, and not feel it near as much. So worldwide now, there's approximately 34 spinal cord stimulators, 34,000 spinal cord stimulators plant, implanted every year, which um, is, is, is a big number. And that tells you not only doctors use this therapy be, because it works, and that's why this field has grown, because these therapies work and they decrease the amount of medications patients need to use. And most patients prefer not to use the opiates or a class of drugs that we call gabapentinoids, which is some people may have heard of Neurotin or seen Lyrica advertised on TV because there's a lot of side effects with those drugs. I'm, and I'm not saying those drugs shouldn't be used at all, but if I can control this, a patient's symptoms with, with electrical stimulation of the spinal cord and not have to have them on drugs, patients tend to feel better, they don't have the lethargy associated with those drugs, and they do much better. So Abbott developed a or a, a gentleman named Dirk de Ritter, who's a neurosurgeon who was in Europe, and yet he now practices in Australia. There's patented therapy called burst DR stimulation. And what, where the name burst DR comes from is the burst therapy is a burst of electrical current that is very fast, and then the current stops, and then you have another burst, and the current stops. So this was developed by Dr. de Ritter, and what he was studying tinnitus, which is ringing in the ears, and he noticed this waveform. And this is the body's natural waveform that it uses all the time. So we had been using conventional spinal cord stimulation, which just developed current constantly. But the problem with that was patients would feel a tingling sensation. So, for example, if it was implanted for a patient who had back surgery, so say had a lumbar fusion, but still had leg pain, we didn't plan the stimulator, and we'd relieve the pain in their leg, but they would be left with this tingling sensation um, in their lower extremities. And a lot of patients didn't mind that, but some did. Um, but they always knew that they were getting something. They were getting some type of therapy because they were feeling that tingling sensation, but it, but it decreased the pain or sometimes eliminated the pain, so patients were happy with that. But with first stimulation, you have this burst of electrical current, and then it stops, and it's so fast you don't even feel it, but it blocks those painful impulses coming up, up from, for example, your legs, 
but you don't feel the stimulation at all. So, so patients just are feeling pain relief. And, and this has proven to be a better therapy. It, it mimics the natural way your, your, your body does work, and it's shown to be beneficial. There's been multiple studies, um, which this next slide demonstrates, but there's been multiple studies that show that burst stimulation is better than the old conventional stimulation that we use. Now, the studies showed that conventional stimulation worked also. It's just burst stimulation worked better. And so what, by using this burst stimulation, it's allowed us to do several other things that's been very beneficial to patients also. And what that done is it's allowed us to use a lot less current to create the stimulation. Consequently, the batteries that we have to use, the amount of current depends determines how long that battery lasts. So when we're just using a burst of current at, at a low rate, we don't burn up these batteries very fast. And so Abbott was out, able to develop batteries that don't need recharged, so, and they can, they can work up to 10 years depending upon what the settings you're having to use. So some of the other systems you have to recharge. So, for example, some of the other um, systems that are out there commercially you have to recharge them for 60 minutes a day. Well, that's an hour out of your day, um, you know, which is 30 hours out of a month and 15 days out of, uh, you know, out of the year. So that's a big time burden. So not only is the therapy with burst stimulation give patients better pain relief than our conventional stimulation, but patients also don't feel the stimulation, and most people like that because they can just kind of forget that they're even having this therapy, and they don't have to recharge the battery. So patients go about their activities of daily living, not having to worry about charging their battery or not having to, you know, and again, it kind of eliminates their pain or significantly decreases their pain, and they, and they kind of forget they even have the system in, um, which, which has been very beneficial, and in my practice, it's, it's a therapy that patients um, really prefer. <clears throat> so again, the new birth stimulation has allowed us to treat a lot of patients with basically hassle-free therapy. They, again, once it's implanted, sometimes we have to program it once or twice. They have a couple follow-ups with the docs where we can check the small little wounds where we have to to make the small little incisions to implant these, um, make sure everything looks good. And I've got a lot of patients, I mean, BIRS hasn't been out there for 10 years yet, I don't think, but um, I've got a lot of patients who I've not seen in years, and this therapy has worked very well, and I won't see them until they probably need a new battery, and I hope, and I hope that's 10 years down the road. So this has been something that's been very beneficial to my practice, and, and I've had – um, a lot of success with this in giving patients pain relief. Okay, um, another question we get quite frequently is the MRI compatibility with these systems. These systems are MRI compatible. Um, so even, you know, it, it, you know it, in prior, prior to some of these systems, you know, sometimes we weren't able to offer spinal cord stimulation to patients because we were concerned that potentially they need, may need an MRI. For example, you know, a patient um, who has multiple sclerosis or something like that who may need recurrent MRIs. Um, now I don't hesitate to put them in because they are MRI compatible. So at this point, I'm going to turn this over to Jessica. Thank you very much, Dr. Girardi. So Dr. Jordan did a great job of setting up kind of what do we do for chronic pain and, and what is stop spinal cord stimulator and, and some of the evidence behind that. And, and my role in this is kind of to get into the nitty gritty of how do we do this? How does this work on a daily basis? How do I get a spinal cord stimulator trial? Who does these? How do I find someone that does these? Um, and so we'll start by talking about sort of the step one in this process. And that's really to have an evaluation by a pain management specialist. You want a physician who is board certified in this, who does this all day long to be able to meet with you, look at everything that you've had going on for however long it is and really have a discussion with you about what your options are and what sort of things may benefit you. 
So that first step, step like we talked about, is you're going to speak with your physician and you're going to say, uh, you know, I've heard about spinal cord stimulation. Is this something that would be helpful for me? And and then that physician can connect you potentially with the representative for the Abbott uh, company who are really there to be a support system for you throughout this process to answer questions, to help with reprogramming, these sort of things. Um, and then and then hopefully you and that physician can discuss uh, whether or not spinal cord stimulation may work for your problem and you can move forward to to looking at what we call a trial system. And that's the first step in this. Um, so the trial system, also called the temporary evaluation, is is probably my favorite part of spinal cord stimulation. When I'm talking to patients on a daily basis, I tell them, you know, you did not get to try out your fusion. Nobody came in and said, hey, why don't you try out your L4-5 fusion for a few days and see if you like it, right? So once done, it's done. Um, and with spinal cord stimulation, the beautiful part of this is that you get to try try that out before you get a permanent implantation. So you get to wear this around externally for um, anywhere from five to seven days and do the things that normally hurt and figure out, is this something that's gonna be helpful? You're able to see how well that therapy controls your pain before you're committing to that implanted, um, implanted system. And you're able to decide, does it help my pain? But really, I think more importantly, does it help my function? Am I able to do things that I otherwise wouldn't be able to do because of this pain? Am I able to sleep better? Am I able to be more active? Am I taking less pain medications, whether that's an anti-inflammatory or opioid medications? Um, overall, am I improved with, with this therapy? So the temporary leads, as Dr. Girardi was mentioning, are put in the epidural space, this potential space outside of the spinal cord there. And the, they are really very thin wires with, with electrodes at the end um, that deliver low energy electrical pulses uh, to sort of interrupt the pain signals. And, um, you know, I think that the the way we sort of discuss this is that the electricity that we're applying is kind of like the dose of a medication, right? Um, and so if we think of it that way, and then, then, then we can understand a little bit better um, how some of these proprietary and specific waveforms like Burst DR are, are really a specific dose of a medication, um, the medication being this, this electrical impulse. So we put these temporary leads in there. It's done um, either at a hospital surgery center or sometimes in the office, wherever your physician performs those, um, those procedures. And it's sometimes done under a little bit of light sedation. There are many physicians who don't use sedation at all um, and use quite a bit of numbing medication. And so that is kind of physician specific, I would say. So those wires are put in, they're, they're secured to the skin. Sometimes they're sutured to the skin, sometimes they're taped to the skin. Um, and then they're connected to this external battery. And you wear it uh, externally. It's, I kind of tell people it's like, a, it's, remember the fanny packs in the 1990s? Although I think they're coming back. I've seen them all over as well now in 2000, or 2020. Um, but it's kind of attached to an external sort of fanny pack that you wear around. And you have an, an Apple iPod that enables you to adjust this therapy. Um, and all of this is explained to you after that procedure. Um, you're walked through this very slowly, most often with um, whoever you bring with you so that you have kind of two sets of ears for that. Um, and the Abbott, Abbott representatives are very helpful in sort of uh, making sure that it's an easily uh, understandable process uh, for how you're going to move through the next five to seven days with that trial. Um, so we, we sort of talked about this um, and and throughout that five to seven day trial, you'll be in contact with that Abbott representative very frequently, making sure that um, that everything's connected and going well and that we're not having any technical issues, making sure that we're doing appropriate changes to the therapy to see if this is gonna be something that's gonna work for you. Um, they'll be asking questions about you know, how you're doing, how you're feeling, if you're having any problems, these sort of things. And then throughout that time, you, you get to, as we said before, kind of determine if this is something that's gonna be, gonna be helpful for you. Um, at the end of that five to seven day trial, those little wires are pulled out um, and that's done in the office very quickly. It's not a secondary procedure. You come into the office, take the tape off, we pull those wires out. And then we ask you the very important questions. Um, we ask, have you been able to sleep better? Tell me about what you were able to do over the course of the last five to seven days that you couldn't do before. Tell me what your thoughts are on the percentage of improvement that you received. Tell me what your thoughts are about moving forward with a permanent system. So 
if you get significant improvement in your symptoms, and by significant, we're talking about over 50% most of the time, um, then we would talk about moving on to an implanted system and what that looks like. Uh, so the, the implanted systems are put in, in a surgery center or a hospital in a sterile environment. Uh, there are three basic components to the implanted system that are very similar to the, to the trial system. There's the leads or the wires, and those are implanted, and then those are connected to an implanted battery that goes under your skin. People always ask, how big is this battery? Am I going to feel it? Is it going to bother me? And I usually tell patients that this is about the size of a pacemaker. And if you think about where we put pacemakers, we put pacemakers in the upper chest, and, and patients do very well with them. They, they don't bother them on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it's about that same size. And so I tell patients, when we put this in, you're going to feel it because it's something new in your body. It's going to stick out a little bit for that first few months, maybe six months. And then after that, it's going to kind of absorb into the fat, wherever that fat may be, in the back or the buttock or wherever that battery gets implanted. And most of the time, it's not going to bother you at all. You're going to need to be able to know it's there so that you can kind of reach back and make sure everything's okay. But it's not going to be something that's typically going to bother you on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not going to stick out six inches. It's not going to be a third appendage. It's not going to be anything remarkable like that. Again, it's about the size of a pacemaker. And then you'll get that Apple iPad controller that enables you to sort of adjust the therapy. So when you're, when you're having these discussions about moving to a permanent system, your physician will likely talk to you about any possible complications or restrictions. They'll talk to you about um, uh, certain activities that can cause the leads uh, to move. And sometimes that can cause an unwanted change in stimulation. In general, you should be able to perform your daily activities with less pain over time. And as Dr. Girardi was mentioning with, with, the, with the burst waveform that allows this battery to not have to be recharged, you're really taking back significant portions of your life. As Dr. Girardi mentioned, some people have to charge systems an hour a day. Without having to do that, this, this infographic here really gives a good idea of what um, what that time savings equates to over 10 years. 76 weekend getaways where you're able to get away without having to think about, did I bring my charger? How long do I need to sit here to charge? Uh, 912 four-hour rounds of golf. So you sort of get the idea here of, of really what that uh, time commitment is to charge a device and, and really what you're, what you're getting in return by not having to charge that device. So um, we talked a little bit before about the Abbott Care team, um, about the representatives uh, who, who work for that company, but whose job it is to care for uh, patients with spinal cord stimulators. And they're there to, um, to help answer questions. They're there to support you through this process. There's a lot of online resources that you can look at and Facebook communities um, that you can be a part of. Um, so that you're not alone in this journey, so that you have uh, people who, have, who are versed in this, people who have been through this before in many ways, uh, to sort of help in that way. And with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Dr. Girardi for some question and answers. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Jameson. Um, at this point, Dr. Burton, are you on? Yeah, I'm on, George. Um, Thank you. Um, I thought, um, you know, we're doing really well on, on time, uh, and uh, it, it's really a pleasure to hear both of you. You're both uh, very experienced neuromodulators. I thought we might lead into the, the Q&A session. Um, if each of you, if, if you've had a memorable uh, patient recently or an anecdote or a story involving uh, neurostimulation, it might be a nice lead into some of the questions that we've gotten from, uh, from the audience. And, and then we'll kind of work through those. Um, well, probably my most memorable patient recently was a patient that I had who was an amputation patient, um, and he was truly, he was a vet, um, and he was truly suicidal, and we put a, a specific type of spinal cord stimulator in him um, that uh, is a little bit different from what we're talking tonight, but this patient left such an impression on me because he literally was, was suicidal 
and he has had his system in for two years now, and I just saw him and did a little bit of reprogramming on him, and he was the most um, grateful. His family was the most grateful. They felt like they, you know, here, the, here their dad went off to, I'm not sure where his, which uh, conflict his injury was from, but he lost his, like, I believe it was in Afghanistan from an IED. Um, but not only was he grateful, but his, his wife and children were all grateful. And again, this, this is a compliment to the research that was, has been done to give me the tools um, to treat this patient. And, and I guess I would add to that, um, you know, I have a, I have, I have two real quick uh, anecdote stories. So one is I had an 82 year old patient who um, had had multiple spine surgeries and had a system in place uh, for about seven years. And she said she started, she used it initially, um, but two things were really quite bothersome to her. One was the recharging. She said, she couldn't do it. She doesn't have a cell phone. She doesn't have a smartphone. She doesn't have Facebook. She doesn't have a computer. It was a real challenge for her to do the recharging. But the second thing was the paresthesia or that tingling sensation that we were talking about earlier. Um, she explained that during her trial period, it, it didn't seem to be as bothersome to her. She said it, it helped her pain and, and it, it was seemed like something that, that she wanted to move forward with. But over time, it began to really be bothersome to her. And so when she came to see me, we had a long discussion about why aren't you using this system that you've had in place for so long? Now, it needed a battery change at that point. And so mm -hmm. after some some discussion, uh, I was able to to chat with her about what a, a new battery would look like that doesn't require the things that, that she was talking about. But that allows the system to not have that num that kind of tingling sensation or those paresthesias, and that doesn't require um, a, a daily recharge. So we put in that battery um, and she came back six weeks later and was higher than a kite. She said she uses it all day, every day. She never turns it off. She doesn't have to mess with it. She doesn't fidget with it and she doesn't feel it. And those things were huge for improving her quality of life. And then the second patient um, was a young patient who is, was actually a nursing professor um, and was unable to really do the the rounds on the floor, couldn't couldn't stand long enough, couldn't sit long enough, couldn't do any of these sort of things that she was required for her job. And, and this was very frustrating for her. She again had had back surgery previously. And so um, wasn't a candidate for any any sort of repeat surgery and really didn't want repeat surgery because she was still in pain uh, after a previous surgery. So we ended up putting a sister uh, system in her and she came back again sort of at our six week mark and said that her life was entirely changed and she was able to go back to work and she's able to teach and she's able to do bedside rounds. Um, and so really just seeing the, the, the change in the quality of life for these patients is, has been just so rewarding. Wow, those are those are both great stories. Um, thank you both for for sharing those. Um, really make a difference in those those uh, lives uh, and really different patients. Uh, all, all of those that you just described are very different, but yet um, it, it was really nice to see how this therapy impacted all, all of them in those unique ways. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw the first question over to you, uh, George. And uh, there's a, pa a person on the audience who wants to know, would, would this um, cure my chronic pain if I get this uh, burst treatment? How do you answer that patient when they're sitting with you or maybe WebExing with you now in COVID times? Um, so the, the way I respond to that question is, is no, it does not cure your chronic pain, but it treats it um, and it relieves your symptoms. And a lot of times, you know, if patients expect 100% pain relief, you know, that's sometimes not achievable. Um, but if we can relieve 80 or 90% of their pain and also allow their activities of daily living um, to be, to, to, for them to do much more and be much more comfortable when they're doing things, that is a success to me. And then the other factor I look at, in addition to having them have more activity, um, if, if they're taking less medications, less narcotics or less uh, other, other medications that they're typically taking, that is, again, a success. So it does not cure your pain, but it treats your pain just like an, a medication would, but hopefully without medication. 
Yeah, and Dr. Burton, I would just add to that, I think, uh, to kind of echo what Dr. Girardi was saying, is that, you know, really setting expectations up front is super important for anything we do, right? For, for medications, for any sort of interventional therapies, but particularly for spinal cord stimulation. So, you know, really trying to, to, to sit down and say, let's list five things that you currently can't do that you really want to be able to do, and let's measure success by that. So maybe you want to go sit at your son's basketball game and you haven't been able to do that for a very long time. That's a measurable thing that we can help with because sometimes we get a little bit lost in this pain score and percentage of pain relief and what does that really mean? And so really having a good understanding of the expectations and what this device can and cannot do and should and should not be expected to do can really set people up for success in this. Uh, great, great answers. I think there's a, you guys both have a lot of experience doing this, and I think uh, to the to the benefit of the patients that uh, you're both treating. Let's uh, go back over to um, to George, and we we have a patient who's um, uh, asking us if um, what is the what are the main differences uh, between the traditional um, spinal cord stimulation system and this um, burst ER system when you describe this to a patient? Like what is the main difference between this new burst stimulation system and the regular kind of stimulators that have been around for a number of years? What are the high points on that? Well, you I, covered a lot of ground in this, but I got a little lost in some of the details. Okay, so I'll give you both the short and the long answer. The short answer will be burst ER, the burst stimulation works better. <laughs> and, and there's scientific studies to demonstrate that. But um, more specifically, the difference is it's a different waveform that we that we've traditionally used, and that different waveform more mimics what your body naturally does. So, so it does give better pain relief because it affects the brain a little bit different. Um, but secondly, you don't feel the paresthesia that, as Dr. Jamison discussed earlier. Some people don't like that paresthesia feeling. In par by paresthesia, I mean that vibration or tingling sensation in, in their, their legs, if, if we're stimulating the legs, because it always reminds them that they're being treated for something. So with the burst DR stimulation, this new waveform, you don't feel any of that, any of those sensations. And then secondly, because it's a much more efficient therapy, we're able to use much less current Consequently, the batteries last a lot longer, and you don't have to recharge the battery, and hopefully it will last 10 years. Now, the time frame on how long a battery lasts is a little bit different for everybody um, because it really does depend on how much current we have to pull out of that battery to treat you. But the main, the main, the main objective is pain relief, and Burst DR, the new waveform, works better, gives the better, patient better pain relief than traditional stimulation, and also, it's kind of a hassle-free therapy where they don't feel it and they don't have to worry about recharging the battery. Okay, uh, thanks. I, I think uh, you definitely hit the, the high points there, uh, Dr. Girardi. Dr. Jamison, um, we have a question from a couple of different patients who take uh, pain medications. And one is a specific question about opioids. The other one just says pain medication. Um, and they really are asking, would they be able to reduce their pain medication with this uh, treatment, and then another one asked, um, "Do they continue to use their pain medication during the trial procedure?" And I'll kind of let you uh, take that topic. Thank you. Okay. Um, so again, the short answer is yes uh, on both of those. So we do anticipate, and we have good evidence to support the fact that spinal cord stimulation can decrease opioids, can decrease pain medication in general, um, and so. What I tell patients is that the expectation, again, setting that expectation, is that we will come off of those opioids. Maybe not all together. I mean, you may go from needing three pills a day to needing one every couple weeks when you're extra active. But the expectation, which I set up front, is that, yes, we will come off because we'll be able to manage that pain and control that pain in a way that doesn't require that. Um, and so the second part of your question about using pain medication during the trial what I tell patients is, if you're on a long-acting pain medication, one that you take once a day or twice a day, and it's a long-acting pain medication, you keep that pain medication going. Um, if you're on a short-acting pain medication, then I want you to see if you need it. 
a lot of times with short acting pain medication, we get to a point where we, we take it X number of times a day because that's what we've been doing for 10 years. And so we, we just do it. But we're not really saying, oh, am I really hurting right now? I'm afraid that the pain may come back, so I'm going to take another pill. So if you're taking a short acting, what I tell my patients is, I want you to see if maybe you don't you don't need it at that 10 o'clock dose. Maybe you can go till 12 o'clock. Maybe you can skip a dose. So for short acting pain medications, I say, I think you should try your hardest to to sort of see if you don't need that. For long acting medications, it's a little bit different in my opinion, and you should. Um, you should probably just continue to, I tell patients, just take that as, as normal. Um, uh, so that's my long answer. Yeah, and, and I would add, as I agree yeah. with everything Jessica, Jessica said, but, but then if, if they're able to get off their short-acting medications and they're still on their long-acting, potentially over time we'll wean them off their long-acting. But I agree, we, ju we just don't stop the long-acting drugs because sometimes that will cause some withdrawal. But again, the goal is to wean them off them also, if possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, great, great answers, very, very thorough. Um, okay, uh, let's, let's go back over to you, Dr. Girardi. There's a patient who asks, how is this different than a TENS unit? Maybe they've used a TENS unit with success a little bit, or maybe they didn't like it, and, and they, uh, they think they kind of connect these dots, like this seems like a TENS unit. Why, why wouldn't I just go get a TENS unit? What's the difference? Well, the difference is the TEN unit is, is stimulated at the level of the skin, so it's stimulating nerves, very small fibers, where with a spinal cord stimulator, we're putting that lead right along a part of the spinal cord called the dorsal column, and that's the back of the spinal cord where all your sensation is. So we're really targeting um, a much better site with spinal cord stimulation, so consequently, it's much more efficient. And we're able to target areas much better. For example, we know exactly where to put that lead if your pain is in, for example, your right leg, or if your pain is in your right arm. We know where to put that lead, where, right where those nerves come into the spinal cord, and we can stimulate right in that area. So it's a much, it's a similar concept but it's a much more efficient um, therapy than, than just a, a, a TENS unit. And secondly, with, with the, the um, burst stimulation, you are not going to feel it at all. Um, and you're, it's going to be something that's implanted in your skin and, you, and underneath your skin, and you don't have to worry about it at all. It's not under, superficially like a TENS unit. Great, and a great, great answer there, George. And uh, Jessica, Dr. Jamison, if you uh, see a patient who says, well, why would I try this? Just to expand that question a little bit, um, because the TENS unit didn't work for me. Does that, does that matter to you at all, or does that, is that relevant? It is not relevant. And so my, my discussion of this, and, and I think Dr. Girardi would probably agree, we get this question all the time. Um, people either say, oh, a TENS worked for me, so this should work, or a TENS didn't work for me, so this this won't work. And when I think of TENS unit, when I prescribe a TENS unit or when a physical therapist prescribes a TENS unit, th that's oftentimes more for the muscle pain than for, um, than for anything else. And so I, it works really great for a muscle pain. Um, if I pick up my four-year-old and hurt my back, I'm going to put a TENS unit on it right away because it's very helpful for that muscle component of pain. But the difference with spinal cord stimulation is, is, as Dr. Girardi was saying, is that the target is different, right? So what we're doing is we are, in the simplest sort of terms, there's a lot of mechanisms that, that go on here, but in the, in the simplest, easiest to understand terms, I talk about the fact that when we are creating this electrical stimulation, this buzzing, even though you can't feel it, it's still a vibration, and that travels on really fast neurons and gets to the brain really fast. Pain signals travel on very slow neurons. So if we create this buzzing sensation, it gets to the brain really fast, and the brain has a hard time paying attention to two things. So it sort of shuts the door to the pain signal. It's a very simplistic uh, sort of explanation of it, but it's, I, I find that it makes it um, sometimes easier to kind of wrap your head around. Um, that the mechanism is is very different from a TENS unit. So if a TENS unit didn't work for you, this could very well work wonderfully. If a TENS unit worked well for you, this may not work. Um, there's not really a correlation in my mind. 
that's a, that's a great answer, and I really like that explanation. I'm sure that makes it clear, uh, much clearer for patients with the, the way you described the electricity skipping to the brain. Um, th- let's stick with you, Dr. Jameson, for a second. And, and this ultimately, this question is going to go for to both of you. You're both live out in the West. You both are kind of in the mountainous, the wide open spaces, Idaho and, and Colorado, uh, Rocky Mountains. And this is around activity restrictions. And there, there's been several questions, a little variation on these, but people want to know, like, what restrictions do I have during the trial procedure, which is maybe about a week or however long that is. And then longer term, can I do things? And these may be patients that live out near where both of you live. Longer term, could I expect or is there any way, could I get back to things like golfing or skiing or hiking? I mean, is that even remotely possible, realizing that I've had chronic pain for 10 years and I, um, you know, I've, I kind of haven't been doing any of that stuff for like a long time. So how does that, is that possible both from the device success standpoint? Will I feel like doing that? And then if I feel like it, is it safe to do that with this kind of implant in me? And I'll, I'll let you start with that, Dr. Jameson, and then I'd like to hear also George on that. That's a that's an excellent question, um, an excellent question, and you'll probably get a little variation on the theme between e- even the two physicians here tonight. But um, I had a gentleman about a month ago who asked me, you know, once I get this put in, am I going to be able to play the violin? Um, you know, with this kind of motion, playing the violin. And I said, I, I don't see any reason that you shouldn't be able to play the violin once this is put in. And his response was, great, because I've never been able to do it before. <laughs> anyway, that being said, um, when we're talking about restrictions during the trial and the restrictions after the permanent implantation, there's sort of two phases of after the permanent implantation. So the first couple weeks there, somewhere between four and six weeks after a permanent implant, is sort of the time where we want people to just be just be careful, be gentle, be careful. That's the time where we're waiting for those wires to really kind of scar into place so that they're not moving. Because when we talk about complications from this procedure, one of the things we discuss is that if the wires move up or down and aren't in the um, aren't in the area that we want them to be, then there's a chance someone may have to go back in there and readjust them. It's not very common, but there is a chance. And so for that first four to six weeks, I restrict patients. I usually will put a binder on them or a sort of a back brace as a way to just remind them that they've had this done because um, I think we can all (laughs) attest to having experiences where patients feel really great in that first few weeks. And I had a lady who went and moved her whole house. She packed up all the boxes, she picked them up, put them in her moving truck and unloaded them. And her wires were entirely out of the epidural space by the time that was done. And so we really want people to be very careful in those first kind of six weeks postpartum. And then after that, gradually getting back into those sort of activities, I say is absolutely fine. But I think, again, this goes back to setting expectations. If this is something that you haven't been able to do for 10 years, then expecting that a device is going to allow you to ski one day, hike the next day, scuba dive the next day is probably not a reasonable thing. Can you? Yes. Should you? Very slowly. During the trial period, that five to seven days, that's an externalized system. So you can't shower during that time. You can't get that wet. We don't want you doing a lot of bending, twisting, reaching, that sort of thing during that trial period in particular. Um, And so those are sort of some of the limitations. In in, in particular, um, can patients golf? They can. Um, Golfing is an interesting sport, but it requires a lot of sort of this rotational movement and uh, a lot of kind of trunk flexion and extension. And so I tell patients that they shouldn't expect to be able to do things like that for a few months after getting that put in. Great, great answer, uh, Jessica. Thank you. Um, George, what do you say on that? You know, I, I agree with everything Jessica said. I mean, you know, the trial part's easy. So it's easy to tell a patient, look, for the next week, I want you to really take it easy because we want to make sure we get an adequate trial. We don't want this lead to move. The harder part is is after you do the implant and patients want to get back to or do things they weren't able to do, all of a sudden you've controlled their pain. And, you know, so I live in Colorado, so I'll have patients all the time ask me if I can ski. Um, and again, the longer these leads are in place, they more they scar in the place. In my experience, the longer a lead in, it, the less chance it has to move. Usually, when they do move, it is early on in the therapies. Um, so, I tell people for the next three three months or so, I, I want them to take it pretty easy and let this scar into place, and then we'll gradually increase their activity. 
Now, if I do have one patient, he was a, a young guy in his late twenties who um, basically wanted to get back to snowboarding, and he was like, "The reason I'm doing this is so I can control my pain and get back to snowboarding." We do have other options for patients who really want to get active like that. So we can have a neurosurgeon, and it's a small little procedure where they actually sew the lead into place. And the chances of that type of lead moving is, is much lower than our needles that are placed through a needle. So if there's a patient who really you know, is adamant about getting back to a really active type of activity relatively quickly, we will discuss, but that's something you need to discuss with, with your pain physician. And that's after you prove the therapy works. First, you do the trial and prove it works. And then you can talk about the different options there are for implantation. And there's, you know, and there's different ways to do it that, that we use in different situations. But again, I let patients get back. To, the whole reason to do this is so they can get back to do what they want to do with the disrealization. The, if you do something that's very, very active, there is a chance you'll move these leads. But if you do, we just we just come back and put them back into place. So, yeah, I think I think there's a ton of wisdom in in the answers that we got from both of you, and it's very clear that um, the audience in this call is getting um, you know hearing from two very uh, experienced neuromodulation specialists. So that that's really really good advice. There's a bunch of questions on that same activity level that are now are just starting to come in. I think people are hearing this topic. And, and I, I will just categorically, just so the people that are still there, that have sent their question and are listening, I would just ask them when they get the, the recording of this, just to listen to what doctors Jameson and Girardi just said on that, and then, and then to ask their doctor about their specifics. There's like a weightlifter, and there's somebody who wants to get chiropractic care and like all that stuff. And I think you guys really kind of already covered that. And, and there's like so many, I mean, we could list like a thousand activities, right, go one by one, and there would be nuanced situations and so on. But I think you hit it at a high level. Ultimately, you want to get these patients back to an active life. It just requires a little bit of care to get them there. They've been down a long time, and you don't want them to get hurt. And the worst thing that can happen if they do overdo it is to dislocate their system and then they need, might need a revision, but it's, it's uh, I mean, I think you guys gave great answers on that. So, so we're in the like last, let's say five minutes of the hour, we want to be respectful of people's uh, time. So I'm gonna, the, the last couple questions, we'll go back to Dr. Jameson and a patient or, or an audience member asks, um, is this the kind of, I've heard about these stimulators and I heard your talk and thank you. Um, well, I, is this a kind of thing, therapy, where I will have to change the settings during the day a lot or make a lot of adjustments or fuss around with it a lot during the day? And I'll throw that question to you, Dr. Jameson. Um, I, and I would say no. I mean, I think my goal is that patients are not having to um, pay a lot of attention to the remote. I mean, the old, the old therapy um, that we used to have up until probably about five or seven years ago um, you know, really required a lot of touch points on that remote throughout the day. And as we've been able to refine that dose of medication and use these paresthesia free or the no feel programs, we've really started to see that patients are not needing to adjust their programs multiple times a day. Can you? Sure. But it's not something that's going to be going to be needed. And to me, that's very important because I don't want you to be reminded 65 times a day about your pain. I want you to be able to sort of turn it on, have it be on the program, and be able to go about your daily life. Great. And then, now we have just a couple quick ones, and then we'll do some housekeeping and, and closing and let you guys have a couple hours of evening back. Um, the, uh, the last question is, uh, I'll give this to you, George. Um, when the airports reopen after COVID, if I have this device, can I get through the TSA? And is that a um, awful? Um, no, it's, TSA is quite familiar with these systems because the, the same protocol if somebody who's had a knee replacement or their hip replacement is, is done with these spinal cord stimulations. You'll have an identification and you, you give it to TSA that, you know, that you have a spinal cord stimulation system in place. And, they'll, and again, they're used to it because this, there's multiple different type of implants. That, and this is just another implant that they're very used to. Okay, great answer. Um, Dr. Jameson, a patient gets this device installed. They have this little iPad, iPod. They kind of lose track of it. If that iPod goes out of charge or if they lose it or it gets falls in the ground and cracks, does their system stop working 
Is the system dependent no. on that little unit to stay powered? Uh, no, it's not. And that's, um, it's, it's controlled by that, but it's not, um, you know, once that device is on, you you know we don't you don't need to charge it. In fact, I have quite a few patients who lose their remote um, because again they're getting pain relief, they're being active, they're doing things, and they misplace it. Do we want you to have it? Yes, because it is an important piece to the therapy. It really sort of expands the capabilities of the device. Um, but but your your it won't just uh, turn off indefinitely if that happens. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you for that answer. And now this answer, I'll give. I'll start with you, George, and then I'll go to Jessica with this one. And then, uh, and then we'll do some closing uh, up to finish on the hour. Um, I've had another stimulator that doesn't work. Is is this still something I should try? And I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Girardi. Um, yeah. So, so that's something you need to intervene to to um, visit with your interventional pain physician about. But I've had lots of patients because our therapies have changed so much over the last just ten years. We're much more successful with the new waveforms and the new placements we have with different leads. Um, a lot of patients who've had non-functioning systems, um, I've had multiple patients who have turned off their system. They come to me and they say, um, I had the system implanted by a, a different implanter 15 years ago. I haven't used it in a few years because it's not working. And then I'd ask them, well, what do you mean it's not working? But with our new therapies, with the new waveforms and the new places we can place leads, I think it, 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 it's very important for you to visit with your interventional pain physician and see if spinal cord stimulation is still an option for you because it, it truly has changed immensely over the last 10 years. Great. Anything you'd like to add on top of that, Dr. Jamison, in your experience? Um, I, I would completely agree with that, and, and I would simply add that um, particularly with burst therapy, the mechanism of action is very different. The way this works is entirely different from traditional systems. So if patients have had a system in place um, and it didn't work, it is entirely possible because we're, we're, we're stimulating different areas. We're doing this in a very different way that you could get relief um, uh, with, with this system. It is entirely possible. But I, I would agree, I would echo what Dr. Girardi said in that Having that discussion with your pain physician who knows you best, who knows your device best, who knows what your problem is and what your pain pattern is best is is um, is paramount. Fantastic. G great answers. Um, great, great session. Thank you uh, so much, um, Dr. George Girardi from Colorado, Dr. Jessica Jameson from beautiful Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Um, it, was, it was really a great, great seminar. You guys uh, did a great job with us scientific topic. I think you brought it to the patient level. And then the, the question and answer is really, uh, I think, showed the audience how good you are with um, patients. And, and you just gave really thoughtful uh, answers that just show how much experience uh, that you both have. So, so we really, really appreciate that. And I know the audience does. Um, for the audience, um, there's a website, uh, www.proclaimxr.com. Um, that is, uh, has all the information uh, that you uh, learned uh, tonight, not as eloquently, but it's uh, there for, for visual uh, reference. And it also has a doctor finder link. If you, uh, your physician doesn't offer this therapy or if you don't have an interventional pain boost and you're looking for one, um, you, uh, you can go through that website and find out. Finally, um, you logged into this website with an email and over the next 24 hours, you'll get a link that will have your um, this recording on it so that you can look back, scroll through the recording, um, hear the wisdom that uh, you got tonight from uh, Dr. Girardi and Jameson. And uh, we wish you um, good health. And uh, from all the folks at Abbott, we just really appreciate the doctors. We appreciate the uh, folks that tuned in tonight, the audience. Hopefully you learned a lot. And uh, stay safe with the, the coronavirus issue. And uh, have a good rest of your evening. Thank you so much, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.